3.8. Identify the sample mean and then don't use it until step four. That's, that's the first place the sample shows up. We feel what's increased the gas price from what? From what it used to be last week. So where does that go? What's the host supposed to have? What's that hoe going to have? Sorry, I had to make it even worse than normal. <laughs> equal sign. Does it have an equal sign? All right, then. Try again. Where's it supposed to go? And what? Yeah, it's supposed to go in the high. So this would be what? Just the opposite, right? So the claim could go either one. I think by now we should all know that. It just depends on if the claim has an equal sign or not. Why is that? Because the way we set it up, we want this one to always set up my rejection region. Because of that, this guy's always got an equal sign. Could we have done it differently? Shit, yeah. But we weren't there when they did it, so we just got to deal with this. Uh -huh. How many tail test, obviously? One. Where's that tail going to be? Up or down? Which way is the arrow pointing? Up. Oh. I love you guys. One tail, right? Is that all right? Do you always face the tail after the claim? No, no. No. Mm -mm. Uh, which one of these always sets up the rejection region? The high does. And it really is just which direction is the arrow going. If it's not equal to, then that's going to be two tail tails. I like it. So that sign, even if you forget how to read that sign, I got a little tear, but at least think arrow that way. Okay. I like it. All right. And then part B, Z or T? Zort. Zort. Which one? I still get people that say, well, we know the standard deviation, so Z is fine. What the shit? What distinguishes between Z and T is which standard deviation do we know? Sigma over S. Yeah, and in this case, what do I know? Sample standard deviation, because it came from my sample. Did I say sample standard deviation? No. Will I say that? Shit, no. Just see, did it come from the sample? Yeah. But what do I need even more important than that? I know I can use T if I can do anything. How do I know I can do something? N equals. Which is greater than 30. Check, it's normal enough. Uh, sigma unknown. So we have to use T. Special place in my heart for uh, the people that do this. I mean, that's I love that shit. No, <laughs> right. So there's a problem like this, and I say we know it's normal. Therefore, you don't have to check that. You don't need the sample size to save your ass if the population is already normal. You guys get that? So we did So I only need this to be true if I don't say anything about normality. This guy says my. If I said it's normal, I don't care what the sample size is. I can do it. So for, uh, in, in order to use the z-score, you have to fulfill both one and two, right? Yeah, to do anything, you need one. It's gotta be normal somehow. In this case, the sample size saved us. Okay. And then which one do I use is which standard deviation do I know? I don't know this one, so I can't use a z-score. If I knew the population standard deviation, I could use a z-score. And again, I forgot to mention this, but those two formulas we put here, these are my Notes, right? When do I use T? Oh. When do I use Z? Oh, right, right. I'm sorry, I don't mean to be, but I've said this before, but I, I don't like, I'm not going to ever let you put notes on your formula sheet, but when the formulas are notes, win for you, if you can realize that. Okay. Baby, baby, baby. If you still have trouble about when to use which one, those formulas tell you. And then you gotta love this. How many formulas are there for a percentage? I'm 
done. So how many formulas are there for a percentage? One. So you only use Z or nothing for percentage. Right? OK, coming back to this. So I know I can use T-scores. What's the next step? Rejection. Yes. Uh, and here's where I got to tell you, use alpha equal to, let's use 0.01. Why not? So what do I need to do to figure out? It, it's kind of interesting to me when people do this step and say T-scores, yes, and then here they use a Z-score. Do what you said you're going to do. Right? So if here you accidentally say Z-score, but then you look up the correct Z-score, you'll lose less points than if here you said Z-score and then you use a T-score. Oh, shit. All right. So what do I need to know to be able to look up that T-score? I know alpha. It's a one-tail test, right? Where I didn't write it down, but it's one tail. So we know alpha, one tail. What's the degrees of freedom? 39. So what do you get for that? Did I bring it? I'm always so mean to myself. Did I? No. I have to. I'll be all right. I can trust you guys. I'm crowdsource. 426. Ooh, 2.426. All right, so now we've got. So if T star is. Greater than 2.426, we can reject the null, support the high. And I know you guys get lost in the weeds and you try to memorize this shit instead of just what makes sense. The null is a dude who thinks it's in here. So if I get there, I can reject what that case said. You ain't right. You ain't in this over there, right? And the highs that you then thinks is up there, so then I can support it if I get in there. So it's fine to memorize some of this stuff, but just make sure you got a little bit of a feel for why what we say makes sense. Just physical sense. Why does it make sense? It has to. All right. Give myself some more room. Now what do we do? We set up where evidence would be. Yes. Oh, no, no, no. I'd have to tell you. Okay. I just forgot to do it here. So sometimes I put it in here and sometimes I put it on the step, right? So somewhere I got to tell you. You're right. If I didn't say, what should you use? 0.05. Okay. That's the most commonly used one, but I will say. So you can freak out. Okay. So now what do I do? Yeah, because now that I've set up where sample has to be to show evidence, the next step would be where the hell did my sample go? Is it enough evidence? Yeah, so what's my sample information? What's X bar? What's S? 18 cents. And what's, then I have to change this. Come a bar over there. There you go, buddy. S over. Square root of. 40? Yeah, that's right, right, right. So I think it's 0.0295. I don't know. Don't believe that. I'm just I'm just trying to do my head, but you never know. 0.0285. What always goes first up here on top? Uh, Our data minus the supposed middle. Where'd you go? So the first one's always what we saw from our samples. Our data minus the claims number. That's we're going to assume that is the middle divided by that new standardization. And I do, another special place in my heart, 
so many places in my heart for you guys. The people that do this work and then they don't use it here. No, he did it. Uh, let's see, 106, 103, so point, it's going to be like two point. The rest of that would be a guess, so I'm not going to do Divided by 14, 15 divided by 7, 2.15. What is it? 2.105. I'm forgetting this other decimal place. So 2.11? Yes. Yes? Okay. So what is that? tell us when we look at our rejection region. We fail. Now, the only thing I want you to realize, is 2.11 a decent distance in standard deviations, right? Two standard deviations, is that a decent distance? Yes? All right. You should know, yes, it is a decent. Was it in this specific case, was it far enough? So if I really believe this claim, what am I going to go do? I'm going to go take a sample, another sample, maybe a little bit bigger sample. And then if I get this, and if I fail again, maybe I'll start to go, well, maybe I'm wrong. Right? That's why we never accept the null, because I can't prove that. It's always just not uh, disproven yet. Just like all science. Law of gravity. You could disprove it tomorrow, although you probably won't. <laughs> That would be completely, if you did, it would be like, holy shit. Yes? Um, and then following up from that, you, you asked what the z-score of like 2.14 can tell in general. So can we explain that that talks about how far the data comes out of the Yeah, like our sample data showed up a little over two standard deviations above the mean, above the accepted middle. Yeah. I wouldn't ask you that in the middle of all this, though. <laughs> But if I did say by itself a little question, what would a 2.11 z-score mean? Yeah. That data point is? 2.11. Standard, Standard deviations. Standard away from the mean. Kick ass. Yes. Oh, we're not done with this, by the way, right? We still got to... What's the conclusion look like? Is that... No, I had a different question. All right, hold on. So step E, we have... And by the way, leap with the ear. Fail to reject the hoe. Fail, support the high. Which wording will I use? What was my claim? So I'm going to use this wording, not that wording. Please let that be that simple. Go back. What was the claim? Use the wording related to that because your, your answer should be about the claim. How did my claim do? Right? We have not found sufficient evidence to to support the claim uh, blah blah and then you just play them. support the claim that the gas price has increased from last week so the sample we took might have just happened to be higher gas prices Right, there's always random fluctuations. That's what hypothesis test is trying to do is, is it so far away that it's, it's kind of like outside the realm of random fluctuations? Because your samples are always going to be a little different. That's why it's got to be so far away. So that it looks like evidence that it's not just random fluctuations. It really is something. Maybe, should I give you the answer, Kino? What was your question about this? Yeah, if I don't take a sample, so um, yeah, like number one, part one, all of those. Because look at what I'm saying. So the, the very first one about coffee, if we selected one adult, what's the probability that that person spent more than 200 bucks? So it's not a sample of people, it's just one. So the standard deviation that's for individuals works because I am picking an individual. So I want to see how the individual 
relates to every other individual. What's the spread of them? Part two, I have a group of 32. Oh, shit, i got to know the spread of all groups of 32. So I can see where that particular one fell. Yeah, so that's where i got to change it. I know what you mean, because it's kind of makes sense. The normal first step in statistics is to take a sample. So the procedure related to what to do once you take a sample should be the one we use most often. And now that we're at this point, we're like, that's what, like you're saying, I like it. We've done that so freaking much, I don't remember not doing that. Yeah, but that's where I didn't really take a sample. It was one person. Yeah. And it really, it's funny, if you look at the formula for one person, what's N? So if you put it in, it stays the same. Interesting. So it's always nice when a formula uh, still works with older stuff. If N's one, it stays the same. Yay, it works. No? Yes? Yes? Oh, the P95? Yeah, okay. That's the workout that's a little better than P90. What does that mean, that big ass P? Probability of. No? Don't choke. So, what does P95 like that mean? And say what? Percentile. So specifically, this is the 95th percentile. In this problem, I know I'm working with a normal curve, so where would the 95th percentile be? Over there. Because 95th percentile means it has 95% below it. And that kicks so much ass for the z-score chart. So this is what I was talking about earlier. Uh, this formula, oh god, versus this formula. This is if I know the raw score, like number one A, I know a cost that can make it a z-score, I can look it up. One C, I know the percentage. So I gotta work back to a z-score, and then I wanna make that z-score back into an x, back into a cost. There's another one where it's like the S one, so that's also a sample standard deviation. So what's the difference between that versus like changing it? Oh, no, no, no. Okay. Let me come back to that in a second. All right. Uh, let's finish this up. Why is that so nice? You can look up at the z scar chart really easy. Anybody did that yet? And, and real quick, I'm about to say something that you don't need to understand at all, but what percentage is here? Yeah, so if I put 0.05 here also, do you see how that's 90 percentile? 90, right? 90 percent? So that's the number that goes with the 90% confidence interval. You don't have to understand what I just said at all. Right? It's, just, it's just interesting <coughs> Interesting why we see these numbers coming up because there's multiple ways to get it. Anyway, so that is where the z-score is that relates to 95th percentile. Now I can figure out, just by putting 1.645 in the equation, the mean plus that. So I've got to go up this many steps to get to that coffee price, the, whatever that was. Call it cost. No, yes, maybe? Yes? Well, then you find the closest in the z-score chart, and you look back out to see what that z-score is. You, I've done that to you a few times. Remember, like, the top 4%, the top 6%, and you're like, oh, Jeff. So then you get something not so clean, like you said. Yeah. All right, and then I want to come back. Who did I skip over? Because you, and I'll come back to you, because this is still related to this. So when I give you two prices, I think they're both going to be over here, right? How do you find the area in between those two prices? Well, to find the area, I have to take the X score and make it into a... And now I've got two, so I've got to make both of them into Z scores. So look up the areas and then subtract. So if I want the probability between two given x scores, I'm going to end up subtracting areas because this is too much. You buy exactly that much. So if I subtract them, I get what's in the middle. 
that makes almost too much physical sense. It's my hope. All right, so coming back to your question, this is really important. Um, I really, I, I, I understand. All right, what do these symbols mean? Yeah, one is standard deviation for a population, one is standard deviation for a. Now let's get even more specific. This is the spread of individuals in a population. This is the spread of individuals in a sample. So if I take a sample of a group of 30, whatever, I don't care which one I know, these are for individual scores. If I take a group of whatever size, I have to change no matter what standard deviation it is. This is for individuals. This is for groups. This is for individuals. This is for groups. So if they ask in a question, um, the sample standard deviation is the standard deviation of the S. Yeah. And then S divided by square root of the M is like an actual sample size, right? No, it's you know the. actual sample size, and you change it to that. Yes. So when do I do either of these formulas? I want you to realize these are both the same. Just one that happened into the population one, and the other one that happened to the sample one. But, uh, when do I change it from this to this? When I'm taking a sample of stuff and asking about the sample mean. Then I have groups. Then I have to change which spread number I'm using. I'm hoping that So this one they calculate from individuals. I made you guys do that with the tables. Didn't we write individual values down and then calculate x minus x bar and all that kind of, well, you remember those fantastic days? So we made them from individual values. These would be what you get if you did every group of size whatever. And thank God the actual formula is that easy. I don't have to make a big ass table. That would desperately suck. So last thing on this. This is the standard deviation of individuals. This is the standard deviation of the distribution of sample means. So it's not, I don't change a population to a sample. That doesn't make any damn sense. These are both population standard deviations. This is one for all the individuals. This is one for all the groups of size M. Example. Yeah, so if I plot X bars, I'm talking about this spread or this spread, either way. So it's all about the operation it's based on. So the way I keep it, well, to be honest, I don't have to think about this shit, but when I first learned it, interval, how can you tell how long it is? So from 5 to 12, how long is that? 7. So 5 to 12 is an interval. It's 7 long. What you use just now, operation, subtraction. Interval means subtraction makes sense. Ratio tells you the name. What's the ratio? It involves what operation? What would be an example? Okay. So uh, the year you were born, right? So if I take the year you were born and the year I was born, subtract them, does the answer make sense? What does it mean physically? If I subtract the years we were born, the answer means age difference, right? Uh, but if I divide the two years we were born, does the answer mean shit? No. It could, because then say somebody was like 40 years old, the other person was 20, that person was twice. No, nah, do you notice what you just did? Are you talking about the same variable I was talking about? I was talking about year we were born. You're talking about a different variable. If it's age, 40 divided by 20 is two. This guy's twice as old, right? Beautiful. But years, why doesn't the division work? And this is what I wish I had more time to get into mathematically. Division only makes sense if zero's in the right place. That was the other thing about ratio, right? So is zero temperature in the right place? No. If it was zero degrees, which I know we're in San Diego, we don't even know that's, you know, like, that's theoretical, right? No, it gets below zero. If it was zero degrees somewhere, twice as hot 
isn't zero degrees, right? It's zero again today. Well, it's 100 times as hot as yesterday. Yeah? Shut up. So zero has to be in the right place for division to make sense. That's why those are the two things I check for ratio. Is zero in the right place? Does zero mean what it's supposed to, the absence of what I'm measuring? Or you can say, if I divide two va data values, does the answer make physical sense? I can divide two zip codes. Does the answer mean anything? No. You guys. So anytime I'm counting something, yeah. like there's a problem, the number of woodpeckers in a tree or the number of cars a cop counts, uh, the number of cars a cop stops, right? Number of, if you don't see any, that's zero. So zero means the absence of what you're counting, that would be a ratio. So if you're counting stuff, that's ratio automatically. Because if I count twice as much as you, okay, there, we just did a ratio, it makes sense. Um, yeah, is that all right? Yeah. All right. Yes. Oh. Yeah, and then I'll give you guys the answer key because some of you guys get very antsy. Let's see. Well, let me give you the answer key, and then I'll see if we need to do a problem like that. All right. The answer key is, of course, the two pages. Should end up with two pages of answer key. Somebody to take that as a challenge. 
Yeah. It just means. So, but look below that. That's just the pass. I'm hoping you're shooting for something higher than that. Oh, for sure. So then you add that thing. I tell you to add. You add it twice to see what you need for like an A minus. Oh, which one? Add. Like you play right Yeah, add 38.5 twice. You guys see it real quick on the on your grade sheet summary. I'm hoping that some of you guys are shooting for more than just pass. Some of you guys are shooting for pass. If you're shooting for more than just pass, at the very bottom, I tell you what to add. I think I did it on the last grade sheet summary, but this is different now because the percentages are correct. Uh, how much you have to add on top to see what you need for a B minus? Add it again for an A minus. I think it's like eight points you add on to take the minus off. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, you can just come to the office and we can just look directly at your shit and see what's going on. Yes? Let's do the day of the final. Let's always do the day of the next test. Yeah, I know. Guys, guys, uh, I am averaging about a 97 on my practice to, uh, answer keys. For B part two, where we find the min and max expected values. Present day Jeff did it right, and past Jeff didn't quite. I only went one up and down, I think. We know it should be two steps up and down, right? Okay. So go ahead and change that on there if you want to. On number four, when I say the minimax, for some reason I decided just to add one step. I probably would have did that thing and just didn't multiply by two. That's the, that's the danger of doing the shortcut. Four. B2, where we find oh. the minimax. I only went one step. I'm supposed to go one more step. Okay, I lock it. Yes? Yeah, all right. So that's the kind of new thing, right? Semi new thing. Or, you know, very new thing. Um, so these are going to have more interesting expected values because how many A's do I expect? What percentage of A's do I expect? 13. 13% of what? I expect 13% A's. Well, how many people am I looking at? 342. 342. So how do I get the expected number of A's? 0.13 times 342. 13% of 